All right, we're going to get started with the uh, narration at the uh, Hyperwall. Uh, I'm Jack Kay from NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. in the U.S. And what I'm going to do is to uh, uh, show some examples of how we're using satellites to study the changes taking place at the Earth's poles and give you some example of some of the things that we're seeing in and around the poles, uh, focusing uh, significantly but not exclusively on ice in the polar regions because there's more things to look at in the poles than just ice. Uh, I always like to start out these uh, hyperwell narrations by saying something about the satellites that are getting most of the data that I'll be showing you over the course of the presentation. Uh, this represents the current fleet of operating satellites that we have. So these are our research satellites. So this does not include the satellites of our operational partners in the U.S or our international partners, both research and operational uh, satellites. Um, these satellites are in um, uh, low Earth orbit, typically seven to 900 kilometers up above the surface, some are a little bit more, mostly uh, orbiting the Earth 14 to 16 times a day, so uh, going around the Earth every 90 to 100 minutes. Uh, so that means they're moving about seven kilometers a second. Uh, most are in, in polar sun synchronous orbit, so that means essentially they're over each pole 15 or so times a day. That's 15 times over the Arctic, 15 times over the Antarctic, where the orbits converge. So you get very good coverage of the polar regions uh, from the satellites. Um, satellites do give us, to a good approximation, equivalent quality coverage uh, anywhere in the world. Um, particularly for those places that are difficult to observe uh, by uh, normal techniques. So the poles are, are great uh, reasons for that. Um, it'll look like a little bit of a jumbled mass of spaghetti, uh, the way the orbits go around the Earth, but there's a um, uh, sort of an organized approach to it. You'll see some where the satellites are, looks like they're chasing each other, constant distant apart. Uh, it's a constellation where we try to get the benefits of simultaneity, um, but build that up over a period of time with launches. Uh, and you can get a lot of instruments studying the same piece of the Earth um, uh, different ways um, at the same time. Uh, some of the uh, satellites don't go over the poles, um, but most do. ISS, International Space Station, that only goes up to about 51 degrees uh, north or south. Um, and uh, a couple of points to make relative to these satellites. Um, about half of them represent international partnerships um, w with a variety of partners, uh, Europe, Japan. We had one that worked for four years with Argentina. Um, uh, so uh, got, had participation from Canada and Brazil and, and uh, some other countries um, in there. Um, something else, a point to make is that uh, after a while, it seems kind of easy um, because the satellites are up there so routinely. Um, it's, it's a pretty harsh environment in space. The uh, satellites, so the half the day, they're on the, 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 the sunlit side of the Earth or half of each orbit. Um, so the full blast, the full power of the sun right on the satellite. Then the other half of the orbit, they're on the dark side of the Earth going into sort of the coldest, darkest night of space and making that transition very, very quickly. Uh, from light to dark and dark to light. So 15 or so times a day, day after day after day. Um, and we've had satellites up there for a number of years. We just had one with Japan, a uh, tropical rainfall measuring mission that ended mission after 17 and a half years. It was supposed to be a three-year mission. Uh, so th that, that's sort of the sources of the data that we get. So next, uh, I'm going to show some uh, uh, data about uh, global temperatures. So this isn't, uh, we obviously didn't have satellite data in the early 1900s, but it shows uh, five-year uh, global temperature anomalies over uh, this long period of time. And uh, the, the sort of the blue is a cold anomaly, and then the yellows are warmer, and the oranges are warmer. And by the time you get to reds, uh, you're getting uh, uh, warmer. So the, the point of this really is to show you that by the time you get up to more or less the present day, Compared to the historical average, the poles are warming a lot. Other parts of the planet are warming too, um, but you can get the sense that there's significant uh, 
warming taking place in the poles and the opportunity for forcings of climate and the opportunities for uh, feedbacks are particularly strong in the polar regions, especially because you have the uh, possibility of melting ice and lots of examples uh, of that. Next. Uh, going to show some examples of a uh, Alaskan glacier and how that changes over a period of time. Um, and uh, what, what you can see is that there's less and less uh, uh, glacier and areas that used to be covered in ice are not covered in, in ice. And this is a particular example, but there's lots of examples of um, uh, th this kind of thing from uh, around the world. Uh, next. We're going to look at um, the annual sea ice uh, minimum. Uh, this is a, so sort of a, one of these annually occurring things that in, in in the fall, one looks at the minimum aerial extent of Arctic sea ice. It's captured with passive microwave uh, instruments from, from space. And we've been doing this for 35 years. Um, and you can see in early on, it would sort of go down, uh, shallow downward trend with a lot of interannual variability. By the time you got into the early part of the century, it looked maybe a little faster. Big drop in 2007, um, another big drop in 2012. And then it bounces back. And if you actually look at where the ice um, ends when you get to that minimum uh, sea ice extent, uh, areas that in the past would have had ice at, at that time no longer have ice at that time. Uh, you look along the northern reaches of Greenland and uh, Canada, um, other areas, you'll see by the time you get to areas that would have had ice there, um, no longer have that. Uh, we're not quite at the Northwest Passage um, uh, situation yet, but that uh, you're getting to a point where the opportunities for, say, marine commerce or uh, navigability are significantly greater than they were in the past, and that, that opens up opportunities uh, but creates challenges as well. So next is another... Um, uh, it'll get there. Um, example of what we've been able to look at in the Arctic. This is the mass change in Greenland. It's determined from GRACE data. GRACE is a pair of satellites. It's a U.S.-German partnership, and it uh, me measures subtle variations in the Earth's gravity. Um, and over Greenland, those variations are caused by the changes in mass. Uh, and there's a spatial pattern, and there's a temporal pattern. And what you can see uh, is that there's an annual cycle uh, but you've got the steady downward um, trend, and if you actually look at where the mass change is taking place, it's taking place closer to the outlines of the continent, and if anything, you're actually gaining ice in the middle of, the, uh, uh, con uh, of Greenland. So if you stop and think about it, it's really kind of a wonderful thing, and, and, and you know, maybe not intuitive or, or and really quite amazing, that, that using the power of space technology, we actually can you know, essentially weigh Greenland and see how the mass is changing from year to year and even get some sense of the internal variation of that. Um, the fact that we can really rigorously and quantitatively look at something like this, I think represents one of the great uh, triumphs of, of, of science, or really the combination of science and engineering uh, that lets you uh, do this. Um, and, and without satellites, it's hard to imagine how you could really even begin to contemplate quantitatively addressing uh, a question like this. Um, next is uh, a similar kind of thing. So, so the flip to the southern hemisphere now, um, and we can see some glacier retreat in um, Argentina. And one can look 1986, 2001, uh, 2014. Uh, and uh, this is done with uh, sort of more traditional land imaging um, satellites. But you see a similar kind of picture of, um, you know, more ice, less ice, even less ice. Um, consistent kind of thing. But one of the, the points of, of doing this is to show that what the, the, the global observing capability that we have from space really gives us this opportunity to look in all parts of the world. You know, so much of the time we may be limited to the areas where, where we live or areas where, um, you know, developed countries where you've got the infrastructure to support the observations, but because, because of the satellites uh, and that space-based vantage point, one can really look all over in these otherwise very inhospitable places and get quantitatively uh, 
useful data. Next. Uh, show a little bit about some things that we do um, uh, from aircraft. Uh, and uh, this, uh, while we're between satellites that do uh, IC th uh, thickness measurements, the, between the ISAT satellite that flew for six years and ISAT 2 that will launch early late 2017, we do a campaign called Operation um, uh, Ice Bridge, where we fly uh, to the Arctic every year and over the Antarctic every year, fly over the ice, make LIDAR measurements of ice sheet thickness and radar measurements so you can get some idea of structure and maybe make gravity measurements. So um, in some cases, what they've been able to do is to be able to actually fly over um, the glaciers and get sort of a, a uh, detailed view of where you're getting cracks in um, uh, areas of ice. So it's the Pine Island Glacier of um, uh, Antarctica. Um, next is uh, shows some work that people have done with satellite data to try to look at the flow of ice on Antarctica. This doesn't actually use uh, any vast satellites. It's uh, based on uh, uh, radar satellites, which are uh, those of our international partners. Um, but the scientists are very good at, at finding the appropriate data sources. And what they can do then is look at the uh, ice flow. Most of us tend to think of ice as, as being you know, it's stationary or it melts, but you don't really think of ice as flowing. It, just, it does just very, very slowly, but it moves enough so that people can actually get some sense of how it's flowing. So you can begin to think about what are the ice sheet dynamics and uh, that then to begin to pose questions so that if the ice is flowing, what happens where ice meets water? We're doing um, some aircraft campaigns now, especially we've got one called OMG for Oceans Melting Greenland, specifically looking at what happens where the oceans meet the ice um, uh, in, in, in the coast of uh, Greenland. So you can begin to look at, uh, as you learn things about what happens at that ocean ice interface on the coast and how the ice may be flowing very slowly towards the, um, uh, towards the coast. Because those kinds of processes are what's going to help determine the rate at which the ice melts um, along the edges and, and therefore the rate at which uh, sea level will rise. Next uh, shows uh, so the Antarctic ice loss over a period of uh, 10 years. Uh, again, using the GRACE data from the NASA um, uh, uh, partnership with Germany from uh, DLR and uh, GFZ. And it's the same kind of thing that you can get a sense over a period of time of, of uh, the, uh, the changes that are taking place and uh, a little bit of where they're taking place. And you see that there's some differences, spatial differences. Uh, there's one part of Antarctica that seems to be losing uh, uh, mass uh, much more rapidly than some of the others. And uh, you're not seeing a lot of uh, uh, the, the, the bluish tints, but you see a lot in sort of this light green. But now you're beginning to get a little bit of a light blue uh, here. So again, it's another example of uh, the kinds of things that it's really very difficult to contemplate. How would you be able to do uh, without the uh, satellite capability? Um, and uh, you, you can see uh, the, uh, it's sort of a less consistent trend than you would see over Greenland. Um, but it's a good example of um, uh, you know, one, one of the, the big lessons of these things where you have data is that uh, we're, we're not getting many monotonic trends. Um, the patterns are very complicated and variable. And uh, if you look at different time segments, you might walk away from a different picture. But when you start putting all of these things together, you can really get a sense of, uh, of what's happening. Uh, next is I uh, wanted to give an example. I'll flip back to the Arctic for a little bit, but it's something that um, we were just trying to look at. We launched a um, satellite early this year, uh, SMAP, Soil Moisture Active Passive, and one can begin uh, to have gotten some data on freeze-thaw state, um, the, um, uh, get some sense as to where the ground is frozen and where the ground is not. And uh, so uh, this is uh, about not even a two-week difference in April. Uh, so red represents areas that have thawed, blue represents areas that have frozen, and one can begin to see how over just that two weeks, there's a real change in the, the uh, frozen state of the um, 
uh, the, the, uh, the Arctic. So it's an example of, of you know, bringing new kinds of observing capability that will let us uh, think about what we learn now and, and what we may be able to do in the future um, to address some of the processes that are taking place at, uh, at high latitudes. And in this case, say we're talking about the poles, well, this maybe isn't the, the, the poles so much, especially because you know, the Arctic is sort of like an you know, ocean surrounded by land, um, but you're looking at the areas that surround, um, uh, surround uh, the Arctic, and in this case, because the poles are not um, uh, disconnected from the rest of the planet. I think I've got, um, let's see, one, one, maybe two more. Um, one, I wanted to uh, uh, mention that it's not just ice at the poles, and uh, if you look at some of the changes that are taking place in the poles, this, uh, this is the Antarctic ozone hole, um, and some sense from the, the uh, ultraviolet-based um, uh, satellites like Total Ozone Mapping Spectrometer, um, and, and the backscatter ultraviolet, and, uh, and then some models that will give us a sense as to what it might look like in the future. Um, but uh, you saw a, a steady uh, decline with some uh, variations from year to year. Um, looks like it's, it's um, bottoming out, maybe beginning to recover, but there's a lot of uh, variability associated with it. But there's the expectation that based on um, the Montreal Protocol, the, the success of the Montreal Protocol and the subsequent uh, um, amendments and modifications that were made that would tighten up emissions of chlorofluorocarbons and increasing set of um, uh, trace uh, uh, gases, the chemically active and radiatively active source gases, uh, stratospheric chlorine levels will decrease and um, uh, chlorine will recover. So, so this is an area where you really could look at the poles, um, the whole polar region every day, day after day after day, year after year after year, and see uh, what's, taking, uh, what's taking place. Um, and, and this is sort of, it's, it's a column integrated ozone, so it's uh, so that everywhere over the poles from the surface up to the top of the atmosphere that's taken into account. Um, and finally, um, give a sense of some of the things that we'll be doing um, in, t in the future um, with, and, and some of the things that we've done recently. Um, uh, SMAP launched, uh, actually launched in 2015, um, but for studying the poles, there's a, a, a number of the satellites that'll be of particular interest. Um, ISAT-2, um, launched the, uh, should be late 2017 to measure ice sheet thickness. It'll be a follow-up to the ISAT-1 that flew earlier. So um, there'll be some other applications because it'll cover the, 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 the whole Earth, but the ice sheet thickness and sea ice freeboard um, all be in uh, high latitudes. Uh, GRACE follow-on, uh, partnership with the GFZ in Germany to uh, continue the same kind of observations that we've been making with GRACE since uh, 2002. And, uh, Besides doing the ice masses, it does uh, a couple of other things. Uh, stored water, it does uh, the uh, you know, basic gravity measurements, can get ocean bottom pressure. Um, and then some of the things, the space stations, mid-inclination orbit won't see the poles. Cygnus for studying tropical cyclones, uh, mid-inclination orbit. Um, uh, uh, NISAR, uh, Synthetic Aperture Radar, uh, partnership with the Indian Space Research Organization, um, doing uh, radar observations um, that'll um, uh, have uh, obvious uh, applications in polar regions and, and, and pace um, uh, for studying uh, ocean carbon that should be able to see some neat things in, in all the oceans, in, including the Arctic. And some of the things we haven't selected yet, so we don't know what, what they are, where they'll be. Um, but um, uh, there'll, there'll be more things in the future, and you come to meetings like this in, in the future, and you'll be able to hear additional results from the things that we have and new results from the things that are, are coming along. So um, as I said, I think the space is a great way to really be able to look at, at the Earth, the poles in particular, and I uh, think we very much um, uh, you know, feel privileged that we can bring the, the power of, of science, technology, um, the, the, the people that we've got um, in NASA and in our funded investigative community and the partnerships that we have with our interagency um, uh, partners and all the international um, uh, agencies and science and, and the scientific community that we work with uh, because the, 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 the uh, challenges that we face are greater than what any of us can do uh, as, as an as a organization, as an agency, as a nation. And the, the real, only real shot that we have to get the world the information that it needs
to understand how it works and how it's likely to evolve in the future comes from us working to, uh, together. So with that, I will stop. Uh, thank you all. Take a couple of questions and um, appreciate you all being here. Uh, we'll be doing another. We do other hyperwall narrations during the, the, the day. There'll be one uh, later today um, uh, on uh, Oceans and Water. Michelle Gerard will be doing that. We'll do some others. We try and uh, swap them around. So if you come back another time, chances are you'll see a different one. So it's fine to return. Thanks. Take any questions. Oh, and if you stop by, we've got some NASA calendars with some really neat imagery, um, and, uh, and not just for the Earth, um, because you get planets, stars, um, uh, sun, and Earth. Um, it's a it's a great calendar, but I'm biased. So, got a question? Thank you very much, uh, Graham Piddock from Australia. Um, you've demonstrated that um, the ozone layer uh, damage was caused by man. Can you demonstrate that global warming is also caused by man? Uh, okay, the question is, can we demonstrate that global warming is caused by man? Um, no, I think the evidence is quite significant. Um, doesn't necessarily mean everyone will look at the evidence the same way. And as we you know, add more evidence, um, you know, I think the case becomes more overwhelming. Um, so, I, you know, I, I certainly believe that the evidence is solid. I mean, I, I think it's important that, that one, when one looks at it, one looks at the whole picture. Um, because you could, if you look at any one thing, um, you know, just as I said, the Earth does not give us many monotonic trends. You can find things that will look different. You know, you see, um, you know, in these non-monotonic times, um, the curves, there are periods where it looks like it's not changing or, or it's not changing very much. You have natural processes like the El Nino, La Nina cycle, which will actually, you know, have trends that will go the other way for a brief period of time. Uh, the Arctic and the Antarctic in particular can behave very differently. You know, you look at uh, sea ice distributions. The Arctic will have a sea ice minimum. The Antarctic will have a sea ice maximum. Um, so, uh, you know, if you look at any one thing, you might see something that will say, well, that, you know, that's not right, or that, that contradicts the, um, the, the, the mental model that we have. So therefore, it, it, it can't be true. But I think you really, the, the power comes from looking at different things, looking at atmospheric temperatures, looking at ocean temperatures, looking at ice distributions, and looking at how the Earth is responding. And, and the picture all comes together. So, you know, I feel, um, the information is, is there. Um, you know, to me, it's a solid case. Okay, we're going to have to stop and... Yeah, I'll take the last question. Um, okay, why don't we do this? Um, uh, to avoid having microphones competing with each other, I'll stop, but I'm happy to take questions over here. Another neat view of the world. <laughs>
Hello. Welcome at the U.S. Center. My name is Tom DiLiberto. I'm one of the MCs here at the U.S. Center for the next two weeks. We have a pretty exciting panel plan for about five minutes from now on predicting weather and climate extremes. So uh, get yourself comfortable and think up some questions. And um, if you guys in the back want to move a little closer, it's always nice to have uh, more folks moving up a little bit closer. So, um, and if anyone is watching online, please remember you can submit any questions using the hashtag AskUSCenter. Thanks. Michael, can you hear us? Is it on? Is it on? Is it sending? No, no, no. It's on the Okay, good. Okay. I can't hear him though. Can we bring him up a little bit? So we can hear us. He's talking, but I can't hear him right now. Michael Michael, if you just want to Yes. Oh perfect. We can hear you. Great, thank you. I don't, I don't know if Ram has mentioned to you, but the way we're going to uh, do the presentation is when you speak to your, when you speak to your slides, we're going to just um, not have you on camera. So you'll see the slides right here in the video, and then you can just speak and tell us to advance. Um, okay, you should know that the video I, I'm getting is a frozen shot right now. Oh, I do see that. Yeah. Okay, let me work on that and try to get okay. it fixed. Thanks. Thank 
Hello, and a welcome again. My name is Tom DiLiberto. Um, I am a meteorologist at the Climate Prediction Center inside the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, otherwise known as NOAA. And I'm pretty excited to uh, introduce our next discussion that's going on right now, um, brought to you by NOAA on the prediction of weather and climate extremes. Now, if you're here earlier at the 115 event, we talked a lot about climate resilience and, and the oceans and in terms of the islands and the Arctic. That's one thing we're looking at now. How can we look at that now into the future, about predicting um, these weather and climate extremes. So I'm pretty excited that we have some time here to learn more about it and have a Q&A afterwards to talk about it. So first, I want to introduce our panel. We have, uh, first off is Dr. Ram Ramaswamy. Ram is the director of NOAA's Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory um, in Princeton and has been involved in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, Working Group 1 Assessments. Re uh, assessments. Uh, research at GFDL um, is focused on the scientific understanding leading to the predictions of weather and climate phenomena on a range of timescales uh, using state-of-the-art models of the Earth system. Our second speaker coming to us via Skype um, is Dr. Michael Oppenheimer. Uh, Michael is the Albert Millibank uh, Professor of Geosciences and International Affairs at Princeton University, and he has also been involved with the IPCC assessments, being a coordinating lead author on the fifth assess assessments working group two report, and has studied extensively climate vulnerability, risks, adaption, and mitigation. And our last speaker is Dr. Barry and Moore. Uh, Professor Moore is the Vice President of Weather and Climate Programs and holds the Chesapeake Energy Corpor Corpor Corporation Chair in Climate Studies at the University of Oklahoma. And he has worked extensively on the carbon biogeochemical cycle, ecosystem science, and climate, and has been an IPCC coordinating lead author as well. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am uh, Ram Ramaswamy, and I'll begin this presentation. Uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge the help we've got in assembling this presentation. My colleagues from GFDL, Witt Anderson, Young Cho, Paul Janu, and uh, Gabe Becky. And then uh, also many thanks go to all the people who organized this event, uh, from the State Department, Isabel Gates and Georgia Mew, along with a host of other people you see on the side there. They are kind of responsible for really bringing this event to life. Uh, Amanda McCarty, who is not here, I think, uh, from NOAA, who actually enabled uh, the uh, organization of the presentation uh, in terms of giving very useful tips and feedbacks. And then uh, the use of the hyperwall from NASA, Eric Sokolowski, who's here, and his colleague, Leon Estrada, who actually were able to get the, some of the movies that we're going to show uh, done for the hyperwall. All right. so. Uh, there are only a few points I want to cover through slides, and one of them is just to depict the complexity of the Earth system. What are we trying to understand and predict? It's all these things. Uh, changes in the sun, changes in the atmosphere, changes in the hydraulic cycle, changes in land, changes in oceans, changes in the biosphere, and the way the system interacts amongst all these components to give us the climate uh, and the extremes uh, that we're going to talk about. So that's kind of one, number one factor, the complexity that you want to capture. And then let's get into the situation of what is observed. So IPCC reports bring out a lot of the science and the assessment of the science as it happens every five years. And I'm just picking up a couple of results from the IPCC 2013 report, Working Group 1. And basically, the central uh, point is there's multiple lines of evidence of a warming world. There's no doubt about that. You look at the temperatures over ocean, they're rising temperature over uh, land. That's rising temperature of the lower atmosphere. That's rising over the last 100 years. And the ocean heat content is rising. Basically, oceans take up the heat that comes into the, that's put up in the atmosphere. Sea surface temperature is rising. Global sea level is rising because water expands. That's kind of the principal component of sea level rise. And then the flip side of some things have to decrease. The Arctic sea ice is decreasing. Snow is decreasing around the globe. And glaciers are decreasing. So all. Taking, taking uh, in, in togetherness, these are the signs of a warming world, not just one variable, but multiplicity of variables. And then looking further at sea level rise, an issue that Michael Oppenheimer is going to talk about in terms of risks. Um, what you see is the satellite altimetry measurements of sea level rise everywhere, and the reds indicate a lot of sea level rise over the last, uh, this actually a 20 year period, eight millimeters a year. Uh, here, this part, and then yellows in many parts, 
And, but of course, sea level rise, the one point on this plot is that sea level rise is not rising uniformly. There are some plots where it's not, for well-known reasons. And then if you look at individual stations where you have tight gauge measurements, and the red line on these plots is the global mean sea level rise. So you can see in some of the cases, the tight gauges are showing agreement, like in San Francisco, agreement with the red line, which means that sea level rise there is almost the same as the global sea level rise. But in some places, it is not. In Stockholm, actually, it's a decrease, partly because of the isostatic rebound issues. And then in some places, it's far greater locally than global mean, like in Manila. And then in some places, there's a lot of oscillations. And this is actually um, very representative of El Nino oscillations. And that's why uh, this appears like this. So there's a lot of things to be said about sea level rise, but it is actually increasing. And it's bound to increase as we are having, as you're going to have more and more warming. All right, so what about the future? Again, drawing upon the IPCC reports, one of the major items that came out of the IPCC 2013 is the fact that the temperature increase, if you measure from pre-industrial times, is related to the cumulative anthropogenic CO2 emissions. And that's because of the two things acting here. One is the radiative effects of CO2, but the other thing is the uptake efficiency of the uh, Earth system in CO2. And that gives rise to the fact that as you keep increasing CO2 in a cumulative sense, uh, in the emissions, the temperature is going to increase. So this is sort of a, a point that is being communicated to decision makers and is in, an important component of uh, management of the CO2 climate issues. Now, continued emissions of greenhouse gases are known to cause further warming. These are model projections. And what you see is continued warming of the planet. The red lines, the blue lines, are simply two different RCP scenarios. Uh, RCP 8.5 is the more sort of aggressive growth of CO2. Concurrent with that, you're going to have the melting of the Arctic sea ice. And in, in this case, it's interesting that even the RCP 2.5 scenario, which is kind of a low CO2 emission growth, is still causing a complete vanishing of Arctic sea ice by the, uh, well into the, beyond the middle of the 21st century. And then also uh, another thing is the increased acidification of the oceans as CO2 gets more and more CO2 gets dissolved in the oceans. Now, one of the things that this presentation is going to emphasize is, of course, we have a long-term climate change. But a key question right now for society and for decision makers is, how are we getting there from today to 2100? What's going to be the situation as we go along? And that brings in the weather. So the weather to climate is now a continuum that we have to deal with. And by continuum, we mean that on the sort of short time scales, you have these severe weather like tornadoes, heat waves, storms, etc. Then you get to interannual uh, variations and changes, such as El Nino, La Nina situations. Then you get to decadal types of variability, and then a multi-decadal, which leads to actually climate. So the whole thing is a continuum, uh, or what we call seamless, and we have to actually now deal with this phenomena. That's kind of what understanding and prediction is, is going to. And one of the reasons, of course, you want to do this is there is now an interrelationship between weather and climate in terms of explaining various catastrophic events. So you have floods, displacements of society. You have snowstorms. And then on the flip side, you have drying of the continental interiors and wildfires created by weather situations as well as these are superposed on long-term climate changes. <clears throat> So in terms of how do we try to deal with this, um, the models that are used, but being used, the global climate models we're using have gone to higher and higher resolutions so that in this kind of still picture, you can see the tendency to capture finer and finer uh, aspects of the atmosphere. In this case, it's actually clouds. And this seamless model, which is kind of, you see the title, is the drive that we are all going to where we can actually resolve this weather climate continuum. And so that we can actually provide the information that's being asked for from a diverse number of sectors in terms of accurate, credible scientific information with characterization and quantification of uncertainties. And some of those sectors are listed here, go, go, goes from maritime uh, management of forests, space operations, energy, hydropower, construction, agriculture, et cetera. So now, uh, I'm going to sort of illustrate this uh, weather to climate, how we are kind of thinking about it. 
in terms of three short movies. And the just to get to describe what those movies are, the first one is going to be talking about short-lived climate forces, and in this case, I'm taking particulates, as simulated by a global model showing the continental and intercontinental dispersion of these aerosols from their source regions. And these are important for not just climate, but they're also important pollutants, so that there's a sort of a twin problem that uh, we are trying to capture here. Then a climate change scenario from the RCP 8.5 and showing some important aspects of the global surface temperature projections, which brings into uh, light uh, some elements that, again, for decision making are very important. And then finally, a really state-of-the-art model to show how we can actually work with the climate model to generate the weather that's happening. And the example that is being, going to be shown is tropical cyclones in a global climate model. So now if we can uh, get to the movies. So the first movie you're going to see is one of aerosols. It's gone through a whole year, the year being 2012. The model is being nudged with NCEP reanalysis winds. So large scale winds are being given to the model. And then you're going to see the distribution of the aerosols. So the color schemes are the blue is sea salt aerosols. The green is black carbon and organic carbon, so carbonaceous aerosols. The whitish gray is sulfate aerosols. And the brown, orange brown, is dust aerosols. And you can see what, what is being imprinted, imprinted by the aerosols is the large scale circulation features, the cyclonic storm, the anticyclones. And you can see very vividly in the southern hemisphere the sort of uh, storms rolling in across the globe. And then some very prominent features, you can, and this is marching in time, I forgot to tell, this is the third month, it's going through March, it's going to run through the whole year. Um, and you see, for example, the dust coming off the Sahara, the biomass burning aerosols uh, from the southern African regions. Uh, you can see the transport of sulfate across from the northeast US, across the Atlantic. And sometimes you can see wisps coming out across from Asia of sulfate right to the west coast of the US. Um, and uh, then you can also see over Asia, as we approach, this is May, you can see sort of the uh, absolute agglomeration of all kinds of aerosols, dust, sulfate, black carbon. And one thing you notice is that these are short-lived entities. But even though they're emitted in one place, they can actually travel long distances because of being carried on the backs of winds. And uh, we're coming now into June. Uh, you again see, um, let's see, oh, you can see the flow into the Arctic, too. Some of the aerosols actually go well beyond the northern latitudes up into the Arctic. And so it is actually a very vivid collection of uh, really what happens to even the short-lived tracers because they travel long distance and therefore have the ability to affect climate in a global fashion, even though they're emitted locally. And as we come to, this is now uh, August, as you come into October, the 10th month, you'll actually see a big dust storm from the Midwest going right across. And then right after that, Hurricane Sandy spins off into the Northeast. You'll kind of see that as we approach the next month. This is now September. Um, and you see dust even in, in the sort of the deserts, the arid lands of Australia. Very realistic, uh, actually, simulation. And in fact, it's being compared to observation. And now you see the Hurricane Sandy there spinning off into the northeast. Now, the next segment is another aerosol movie, but this is actually now focused on East Asia. And this is running over a, a period in 2012. And here, this is actually white now is sulfate and carbonaceous aerosols showing, such a, showing, showing a very dense uh, pollution over that region of these aerosols, but, in, but you also see dust coming from way across Mongolia into the Asian region. Next is Australia, and this is actually a particular year, 2009, when there was actually a lot of dust uh, which cropped up from the from middle of Australia, but you can see that again the dust and the sea salt, uh, which is coming off these storms in the high southern latitudes, actually mixing um, with each other. And you see this big tongue of uh, dust actually going across right off the southern coast of Australia. And also carbonaceous aerosols, too. I forgot to mention the brighter the coloration, it means the more heavier the loading at that point. 
And then finally, so this is, this is a really big jack, and this is actually, uh, NASA ob satellite observations actually recorded this. <coughs> I'm going to wait for this to finish. And then the last part of this movie is actually showing how you can actually use these models to take source regions individually and watch the transport of dust. This is a natural dust from the surfaces uh, in the Sahara region uh, and going all the way across to actually South America. There's actually paleoclimatic evidence that a lot of dust in South America, a uh, lot of uh, dust samples in South America actually could, can be traced back to the uh, flow from Africa. And you can see that as the sort of uh, seasons change, this is now May, as seasons change, the flow sort of becomes a little bit more uh, east, uh, westward, sorry. And you can see that some parts of even Central America uh, and even sometimes Florida actually get um, all these dust coming in from there, from, from different regions. But you can actually sort of use now these models to do these kind of fine analysis uh, and I forgot to mention the resolution, this 50 kilometer global model, so you can actually see uh, these things on a, on a very fine scale. But, it, but you also have flow from other places too, which kind of mingles in, which makes for a, which makes for complexity of analysis of where, uh, where the uh, dust, individual dust is coming from at the receptor region, because there are different regions, different source regions from where it could have come. All right, then the uh, next movie is going to be the uh, global surface temperature projection. This is starting from about 2040. And as it goes to 2100, uh, you can see parts warming. The red, the red is warming. The blue is actually cooling. And so this brings, it, brings up an you know, important aspect that locally you can have variability such that you can actually get colder than the uh, previous year. So intranial variability, especially in southern, southern oceans, it is pretty high. But as it goes to 2100, you can see that the land warms faster than the ocean, the northern hemisphere warms faster than the southern hemisphere, and the northern polar regions warm much faster than any other region on, on the globe. So just watch, land is warming faster than the ocean, northern hemisphere is warming faster than the southern hemisphere, and the northern polar regions, i.e. the Arctic, is warming much faster than equatorial or southern hemisphere regions. In fact, at the end of the simulation, that's about eight, eight degrees and more in the northern hemisphere relative to today. So it's not even pre-industrial, it's relative to today. And this is the RCP 8.5 scenario, so obviously it's a more aggressive CO2 scenario, and the RCP 2.5 just is lesser, but the contrast is really there. All right, this is the last movie where we're showing the uh, 25 kilometer global model so that's, that's, that's fine as some of the weather models today. And where the weather and what, the, the, what is re represented here as a proxy is a total condensate in the atmosphere. So total condensed water in the form of clouds, water vapor, ice cloud, water clouds. And what you're seeing is storms spinning off. And these are in various categories. Tropical storm is green. When it reaches yellow, that's hurricane category one and two. And then red is hurricane category three, four, and five. And this is a particular year using the 2000s greenhouse gas emissions. And what is circled is when the storms form and are categorized according to the WMO definitions. And this movie starts in January, so most of the storms are in the southern hemisphere. And as, the, as you go to Jan, June and July and August, you'll see the storms moving up into the northern hemisphere. And this is fairly realistic because you know that this, re this region is prone to many storms, so it's sort of this region here. And then as, as you uh, go into the, further into the year, you'll see storms spinning off here and uh, of Africa. And uh, so this is kind of a model that we, we, can, we are using it for seasonal prediction, uh, which means that every month uh, there's a 90-day prediction which is put out for anyone to verify. It's out on the website of NCEP. It's, called, it's part of the North American Multimodal Ensemble. So anyone can go and check it out. And it's giving fairly uh, good results, I would say, reasonable. There's still a lot of uh, things to be ironed out in this model, but it shows the capacity that we have today to actually go into the climate models and actually do weather in those climate models so that you have a seamless model, not only a system, but just a seamless model that goes all the way from hurricane scales, hurricane time scales, to 
longer time scales, intraannual, decadal, centennial. So you see these, some of these storms are pretty vicious. Uh, category three, four, five with wind speeds exceeding uh, 60 meters per second. And it also shows sort of how the circulation is uh, uh, spawning uh, these, these storms. Just interesting to watch this quietly without my speaking. It's so spectacular. Uh, and all, all these regions are just, and this is a coupled model, coupled ocean atmosphere, uh, free running model. So it is not yet a prediction model because of prediction, you want to use initial values to drive it. That's not be done in this particular movie, although this model has been used to do the initial value pro uh, problem, and that's kind of what leads to seasonal predictions that we put out every, every uh, month for seasons. <clears throat> now, you know, some of the regions are not necessarily exactly the same as what is observed in nature, really, but that's kind of one of the things that we have to improve upon the model. Uh, some regions have fewer storms than what is observed. Some regions have far greater storms than observed. Now, as we are approaching into April, uh, you're going to see sort of this region gets very intensely active uh, during the pre-monsoon phase and then the monsoon seasons, uh, June, July, August, will be totally covered with white. And that's kind of uh, symptomatic of the uh, water, condensed water that forms there. <clears throat> How am I doing on time? Look at that. Okay. And there are some months, like uh, in this particular case, the month of May, uh, not May, June. June turns out to be rather quiescent uh, in this particular uh, run. And you, you can actually see even the, how the storms uh, or the motions carry the, uh, carry the flow towards the poles. And that actually has important implications for how cloudiness and uh, poleward transfer of heat uh, is being done in the, in the atmosphere. <clears throat> now you can see the storms have started moving up. You can see uh, the storms coming off, and then, and some of these tropical storms actually then morph into extratropical storms. So not all of them, but sometimes they morph into extratropical storms. There's one more here. So there are some months where you don't have intense storms. You can see that January to April, um, quite a few uh, hurricane category three, four, five storms, but April, May, uh, not much. I'm waiting for storms to form here, which should happen in uh, June, July. And you can see now the um, the sort of cloud cover that comes into this region here as we go into May and June and starting to pick up over uh, South Asia too. And there is one. So there's a pretty quiescent time in May, June. And picking up now, you can see the monsoon picking up with the uh, white conden condensate over the almost entire Asia. And now you start to pick up storms here, forming off the coast of Africa, moving uh, westward. And there's only one which actually strikes the coast in this simulation, but you can see a lot of them coming up and then sort of veering towards the uh, northeast and not, not necessarily reaching the coast. Three minutes. <clears throat> 
Where is this one? More spinning up here. And more spinning up here, too. This, this actually, in this simulation, that turns out to be a pretty violent region in terms of storms. They keep coming up. Okay, you can see a lot of storms there off Asia. <coughs> this one is the most powerful, 76 meters per second, which went up in Asia. Okay, and there is one more. I don't think it goes all the way. They keep forming in clumps here for some reason, uh, one after the other. Okay, so you get the picture that the, the capability exists with a model like this to actually look at the weather in a climate change context. And I think that was the major point that you can catch with the models now the complexity of the system as well as provide the regional information on, on these uh, tropical storms. So I think I'm going to ask the movie to shut off. Gary? Okay. So now uh, we are, the next slide, please. Oh, sorry, I, I got it. So we're going to now uh, turn to Michael Oppenheimer, uh, who's going to talk about prospects for impacts and adaptation along the coast and talking about climate uh, and climate change and the risks. So Michael, over to you. Thank you for inviting me to do this presentation, especially uh, via video link. I, I won't actually be in Paris until next week. Um, the point of my presentation um, is to emphasize that adaptation to the consequences of climate change is not just a theoretical concept, but rather a current necessity in the minds of decision makers in both developed countries like the US, and, but also developing countries. Now, the key concept to take away from this presentation is that while uh, much of the focus heretofore has been on emissions mitigation, and while emissions mitigation remains a top priority if dangerous levels of warming are to be averted, at the same time, climate changes are baked into the system basically until around 2035 or 2040. That is the climate changes we're going to get over the next uh, 25 years or so are rather insensitive to the emissions pathway we follow over that period, with emissions mitigation becoming much more important beyond. Uh, and that therefore, there are climate changes that have already happened and that will happen uh, in the next uh, couple of decades that will uh, demand uh, greater action on the adaptation front. Um, it follows that the rather inadequate responses we often have to current levels of climate risk should be a grave concern because over time, as I said, the risk is going to be increasing and it's going to be increasing continuously. For instance, uh, according to uh, the uh, fifth assessment of IPCC, uh, the days which are historically the 10 percent hottest over the, uh, the previous many decades uh, are going to occur about 30% of the time by uh, the year 2035 or 2040. Uh, a flood, a coastal flood level, which was reached only about once every 100 years, the uh, so-called 100-year flood, uh, could occur by the end of this century uh, every 10 years, every five years, according to estimates in the uh, fifth assessment. So the physical uh, side, the, the probability of, of of, uh, tr of events which are difficult to adapt to already are going to be increasing. What I'd like to emphasize now is the interactions of humans and the climate system, which is shown in the next slide. Uh, this uh, propeller diagram from um, originally the so-called SREX report, but also it's in uh, the fifth assessment. A sensible objective of policy is a decreased risk. Risk is made up of three components. The probability of occurrence of a given level of damages, like a flood or a heat wave. That's the physical side. That's the side that on the left that can be affected by emissions mitigation. But then we have two components on the right, which are really on the is socioeconomic effects. Those are vulnerability and exposure. And they are uh, they can be managed through improving efforts at adaptation. 
Exposure means people, infrastructure, ecosystems, basically being in the wrong place at the wrong time and exposed, exposed to extreme climate events. Vulnerability means the sensitivity. If one is exposed to such events, what's the predisposition to harm or damage? And so again, adaptation means reducing through adaptation, both vulnerability and exposure. Now, I'm going to emphasize coastal risk arising mostly from sea level rise and potentially from intensification of, for instance, tropical cyclones or on the U.S. coast hurricanes. Uh, let's see the next slide. Uh, this slide il illustrates that um, exposure, which is one of the important components of risk, is made up not just of the extra amount of exposure due to climate change, that is, for instance, uh, warming leading to sea level rise and causing floods to penetrate over greater areas uh, along the coast, uh, but also that uh, changes that are already happening uh, and which may become more intense in the future, um, for instance, changes in the in the amount of uh, in the numbers of population along the coast, which on this slide, for instance, uh, let's look at the furthest left hand bar, which represents the change in exposure to the current 100-year flooding by 2070, uh, you'll see that the current uh, expo exposed population, and this is in thousands, so for instance, the number at the lowest uh, side of the left-hand bar is equivalent to a population of 5 million. The light green is today's exposed population. The dark green is the added population by 2070 that's exposed just by socioeconomic changes, and that means more people moving into the coast, for instance, more buildings, etc. And the yellow ball top is Hello, bear with us when it's with for a sec to see if we can get back the audio or tell Dr. Oppenheimer that we can't hear him. The joys of technology. Am I back? Okay. Let's look at the next slide. The third slide refers specifically to coastal risk around New York City, and it draws on the, and I use it because I live in New York City and because it was a subject of particular damage in, uh, in Hurricane Sandy in 2012. So the, the third slide makes this point about vulnerability and exposure in a different way. And it's gonna sh it shows both our lack of being prepared, but also how much the risk can change due to re relatively small sea level rise amounts in the future. So uh, a key benchmark for resilience of the city is the continued function of the subway system, which is the lifeblood of, of New York. During Sandy, the system was knocked out for three or four days. A combination of very dedicated transit workers and a lot of good luck allowed the water to be the seawater, which is very corrosive, to be pumped out of the system quickly and therefore thereby save the system from potentially months or more of shutdown. Now look at this figure, uh, which shows the top flood levels in all coastal storms, uh, the 10 biggest ones over the last 65 years. The storm on the right is Hurricane Sandy. You'll note that the flood level was way above, it's 14 feet above low tide, way above all the others. But notice also the horizontal red line. That's the flood level at which salt water gets into the subway system and potentially corrodes it. So here are the two messages from this slide. Number one, if you added a foot or two of sea level rise, which is the projection, by the way, for New York City by mid-century, uh, you would have moved almost all of those storms up above the 10 and a half foot line, which means they would have flooded the subway system. You'll also, the other lesson is that despite this experience of almost flooding the subway system for, uh, nine times before Hurricane Sandy, almost nothing was done to protect the system. And that's kind of indicative of how difficult it's been 
for policymakers to move forward and address the current level of risk without even thinking about what the increased risk is in the future when a storm like Hurricane Sandy, instead of occurring maybe every 500 years, by the end of the century occurs maybe every 10 to 50 years, according to the projections we have. The story is somewhat more promising for heat waves, where the ability of local governments to act to protect against a risk has improved over time. But overall, our ability to respond, the record on responding to extreme climate events is not particularly promising in face of the increasing risk. Um, in the meantime, um, we're really in a position of having to make decisions which are important for whether we should do the relatively straightforward things like moving emergency equipment for hospitals and other buildings out of the flood zone, plugging subway entrances, et cetera, or doing large scale expensive projects like building surge barriers like the one on the Thames. And frankly, we are not really focused very well on what's needed to happen to actually make those decisions. So let's see the final slide. And here I just want to make the point that even relatively simple measures, doing the simple, straightforward things that would be necessary to cut today's risk can have an important effect in reducing the, incre the increasing threat in the future. So consider what would be possible if we just implemented current best practices. Uh, I just give you the example from Bangladesh, uh, because it's a poor country, uh, there are 150 million people in the an area of the space of Wisconsin, and it's been victimized by cyclones for eons as they come up and hit the south coast uh, of, uh, on, on the north end of the Bay of Bengal. In 1970, about a million people died in a cyclone that hit the coast. Today, similar storms bring much lower death rates. Not Still not good, but in the thousands instead of the hundred thousands. Why? Because the government uh, uh, helped get together an early warning system to let people know storms were coming and build concrete bunkers like the one you see on the slide here to give them some place to go. The lesson is straightforward. We ought to start doing a better job in dealing with today's risks, even doing the relatively simple, straightforward things that sometimes we don't do in order to smooth the path to improvement in that adapting as inevitably the probability of heretofore unusual events like Hurricane Sandy inevitably increase over the next few decades. Thank you. Hello. Is this working? <clears throat> I'm Barry Ed Moore, and I'm delighted to be here. I'm going to be talking about the atmospheric carbon, particularly atmospheric carbon dioxide and methane. And as Ram showed, there's a very strong relationship between uh, atmospheric carbon, particularly CO2, total emissions, and temperature. So wh what is this carbon cul-de-sac? And I'm also going to be addressing something that Michael Bloomberg has said. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So what we need is a carbon observing system that would be based in terms of in situ measurements on towers, ships, and aircraft, as well as satellites. Right now, we have two satellites that are devoted to measuring greenhouse gases, the Japanese Global uh, Greenhouse Observing Satellite, GOSAT, and the Orbiting Carbon Observatory, OCO2, by NASA. So we can say that we have a sparse exploratory carbon observing system, framework that is, but what we need is a dense, robust, sustained carbon observing system. And I want to just show two elements of that system that we need in the future. First, uh, the two satellites that I mentioned, GOSAT and uh, OCO, the Orbiting Carbon Observatory, are in low Earth orbit. That is, they orbit from pole to pole, and then as the Earth turns, they trace out fractions of the atmosphere going from pole to pole. That's very useful, and we have weather satellites that do the same thing. We also have weather satellites that sit in geostationary orbit and stare at the Earth. And I want to talk about one such initiative that we need in the future. 
I won't dwell on this, but it basically shows a four-channel spectrometer. This is exactly like what the Orb Orbiting Carbon Observatory looks like, except it has an additional channel to measure methane and carbon monoxide. And it would be in geostationary orbit. This is just three examples. And it would be able to measure wall to wall, multiple times a day, each of those rectangles, so that you would actually now begin to map regions of the world. This gives you an example of that in the Shanghai Nanjing area. The, uh, ghost, uh, the geostationary satellite is essentially mapping across this grid every three kilometers by every three kilometers multiple times a day, looking at all of Southeast Asia. Whereas in this particular area, the Nanjing Shanghai, the little green bands show the orbiting carbon observatory going by on day one. Eight days later is the next time the orbiting carbon observatory would visit this area, comes in and out to the east. Eight days later, 16 days, it repeats the original track. Whereas from geostationary, you could be mapping every day, multiple times a day, this entire region, in fact, all of Southeast Asia. So that would be a new element that is needed in a carbon climate observing system. Let me show you an additional element. And this builds upon what Phil DeCola talked about earlier this morning when he was looking at cities. In fact, the most logical city to look at is Paris. We have right now two lasers, one at the University of Paris Science in Jussieu on the tall tower, and one just in front of Montparnasse on a uh, tall tower, but not as tall as Montparnasse. So these are two lasers, and they send out a signal on the absorption band of CO2. And they hit a reflector, and the signal comes back. You me measure a change in the strength of that signal. And from that, you can infer what the carbon dioxide concentration. This gives you an example of what you can see every five seconds. So the blue uh, are the two laser observing, uh, the laser sending signals. The little circle around the perifique those are the reflectors where you can see the signal coming back. So you can see the one in the, more or less in the center of the picture, that's just in front of Mount Montparnasse, and the one over at Jussieu, where it says T1, Jussieu Tower, that's the one at the Science University. So each of these is sending out pulses, and with that, you can measure the carbon dioxide concentration every five seconds. So, as I said, what you can't measure, you can't manage. Clearly, we're going to have to manage the carbon question. This is not a problem that is going to, away, going to go away. And so what I've tried to do is introduce, very briefly, two elements of a future carbon observing system. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. We do have uh, plenty of time for some questions and answers with, uh, with our guests. So with that, I will remind everyone watching uh, on the live stream, feel free to ask questions using the hashtag AskUSCenter. Um, but with that, I'll take any questions from the audience. Well, I'll start off then. I, I have a question for, for all of you. I guess you can probably all touch on this a little bit. Um, it seems like what we're talking about a lot is it, we, sh we saw the, the modeling techniques. We saw this idea of vulnerability and risk and, and that sort of communication and this carbon observing system. Um, in what sense, how do we communicate this? How do we communicate what we're seeing from the models? How do we communicate what the models say about vulnerability to the policymakers? Because we're the sci you're, you're the scientist. How do we communicate what you're seeing so that they'll understand what they could possibly do? So I'll, I'll take a stab at it and then... Um... Michael and Berrien can add to it. Uh, speaking from the modeling side, I think one of the ways in which communications is going on currently in the present times is through the IPCC assessments, particularly the science coming through from Working Group 1. And I think that does a lot, but it, there's probably more room for improvements, particularly in terms of the characterization of the uncertainties. You know, what are the uncertainties and how are we going to not just specify the uncertainties, but how are we going to get over them? You know, whether it's uncertainties due to short-lived forcings like aerosols and ozone, or whether it's uh, uncertainties due to clouds, 
or whether it's uncertainty is due to carbon uptake, or whether it's due to heat uptake in southern oceans, all these are leading uncertainties in terms of how global warming is going to proceed. But we have to do a better job at communicating the science part. And I think IPCC process demonstrates how it can be done, but probably I think more should be done in terms of actually a more uh, concerted strategy to be communicating not just in the five-year IPCC timescales, but really all the time. I'll, I'll now pass on to, let's see, I'll go Michael since Michael was next. Michael, you want to add something to that? Yeah, sure. I just want to pick up on that uh, comment by saying that I think what's important as we move into a phase where local decision makers are very concerned about adaptation planning, that some of the basic science, uh, which develops ways of communicating, it, it, scientists communicate uncertainty and their sort of best estimates in a particular way, but uh, developing uh, interactions with stakeholders who actually have to make the decisions from an early phase is going to be critically important. For instance, I'm on a panel called the New York Panel on Climate Change that provides technical estimates to the mayor's office. It was put together by Mayor Bloomberg originally and carried on now by Mayor de Blasio. And we are, we are from the beginning, not just developing estimates of flood risk, but uh, getting together with stakeholders to see what they understand and what are the numbers and the framing of those numbers that they like. There's a tradition in the scientific community, partly because of the requirements of the insurance uh, framework we have in the U.S. to frame things in terms of the once in a hundred year flood, but is that the best way to talk about it, especially in a situation where the risk is changing, the probabilities are changing, and the uncertainties are changing too. So my one recommendation would be that the process of engagement with stakeholders has to start early and be carried out often. Uh, this is Barry and Moore. I'd like to begin uh, build on what Michael just said and particularly focus on two stakeholders, the mayors of the cities of the world. I think they understand it. They're at ground zero. They know that they need to do something. Action is not out of their framework. And secondly, the major businesses of the world, the reinsurance companies, the technology companies, the transportation companies. They understand this. They get it. So I think that by focusing on, on decision makers that really are at ground zero, that will be a very important part of the communication process. Thanks. Thank you. Ram, uh, can you say something about the utility of the high resolution model that you showed where you could con conceive of doing a ensemble run with a certain scenario and then develop PDFs of extreme weather at some point in the future? Is that something that's possible with, with that capability? Uh, yes, it certainly is. I think uh, that, in fact, uh, the, the procedure you outlined is exactly what uh, uh, we have in mind. And in fact, it's in, even in process in terms of seasonal prediction. But in terms of, let's say, decadal, multi-decadal predictions, yes, that's kind of the process that we, we think uh, is no longer a dream, no longer an act of fiction. It's actually possible. And then actually, the, the main, once we have this thing going, the main process would be one of verification because that's when you build confidence in the models. So hopefully, you know, I mean, the experience generally has been that as you go to higher resolution, uh, you're capturing more regional information, but it's not only that. You're solving the equations on a much more finer scale and leaving less to, let's say, formulations that are cooked up. They're actually more uh, ab initio. So because of that, you actually get improvements both on the physical science side and then on the interpretive side, because you're capturing regional information much better. But I don't want to minimize the issue of complexity, which I didn't elaborate on much. But um, as you go towards, for example, constructing PDFs, I think it's going to be important to test uh, what complexity is getting you. And sometimes it can get you garbage. So you have to be aware of that. But hopefully, you know, uh, some kind of a rational pathway would actually see complexity absorbed in the model actually going to, and doing better things in terms of model simulations. Ram, real quick, can you just describe the benefits? This is me over here, sorry. Uh, can you describe the benefits of PDFs, just so folks who may not understand what those are? Okay, so uh, PDFs are probability den uh, density functions, probability distribution functions. And basically, the, the, if you're, when, you're start, when you're starting to predict the weather, uh, 
or you want to know starting from today, what is the condition going to be one year, two years, 10 years, 20 years from now? There, there are certain, there's of course, let's say there is a cli climate forcing going on by CO2. But on top of that, you also have what is called the initial value problem, where depending on the state today, under the same forces, the climate can evolve along different trajectories. So how do you cover the ground according to different trajectories? Because sometimes the initial state is not well known. For, for example, you, we don't sample all parts of the atmosphere, and we don't sample all parts of the global oceans. So how do we start to get about an initial state of this Earth system becomes a big problem in itself. So what happens, and this happens, for example, in the weather forecast models, there are several ensembles run where you start from different initial conditions, slightly different from each other, to see where the system wants to go. Now, it would turn out that most of the, for weather 24-hour, 48-hour weather forecast, most of the tendency is toward a certain direction, but you only know about it after running several members of the so-called ensemble. Typically, I think in the US weather forecast, something like 80 to 100 members are run. So you take the average of those, that gets you a mean weather. So similarly to that, we want to extend the same principle to the climate system, which goes back to Phil's question of the PDFs, that you want to be able to run several ensemble members so that you're, you're, protect, you're not only looking at the mean, but you're also looking at the possibility of extremes. Because the Earth system goes through a simulation only once. You know, if you're watching the weather between today and tomorrow, that's only one realization that the Earth system is going through. Now, numerically, and because we are smart human beings, we can actually construct several different states. But the, ahead of time, you have to sort of guess, or you have to make some educated rationale as to which one is going to be the real track of the system. And that's what you don't know. And that's where the number of members, of uns number of ensemble members that you have begins to dictate how accurate you get to the end. Even then, there are uncertainties. But it's one way of getting into the uncertainties, and that's kind of what is meant by the PDFs, several, doing several calculations, uh, starting from different initial conditions. This is a brief question for Barian. Uh, Barian, uh, I think the uh, geostationary carbon sensor is an extraordinarily important idea. Uh, but my question is, uh, what is the maturity in prospects? Is it a technology that we uh, understand well, that we can uh, get uh, this kind of a satellite uh, up uh, in the relative near term of uh, a few years, uh, how how far are we along in reaching this? Uh, I think very important goal. From my perspective, I think that we can do this today. And the reason being is that the instrument is essentially what is flying right now in low Earth orbit, the uh, Orbiting Carbon Observatory 2 from NASA. And all we've done is just add an additional channel to measure methane and CO. And you get your signal to noise, that is, I can get the accuracy I need, even though I'm much further away from the Earth in geostationary orbit, by staring. So I stare for four seconds, and that gets me the signal to noise that a low Earth orbiting satellite has. And then I look slightly to the west, a stare another four seconds, look slightly to the west, and map out those rectangles. So essentially, it's the same technology we have on orbit right now. And certainly, we know how to build geostationary satellites. In fact, uh, the Earth launches a geostationary satellite about once a month for communication purposes bottom of those satellites is essentially empty. So you've already got a potential host right there. So I don't see any, uh, any limiter uh, in terms of doing this. Yeah, thank you. I'm Keith Shepard from World Agroforestry Center, in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, you've made a call for collecting a lot more data, daily data, higher resolution data. But have you actually gone back and uh, identified the decisions that you hope to support with this data, 
formally analyzed them and calculated the value of information because time and time again it's been shown that we're collecting the data in the wrong places to actually improve decision making. Um, so I'm, I'm asking, have you actually gone back and looked at the decisions you're trying to inform and formally analyzed them to identify the, the critical data needs? So let me try to understand your question. Is a question uh, about the decisions being made on the high resolution data and have you gone back and revisited them? No, the, the users, who's going to use this data to, what, to make which decisions? Use the high resolution data. Yeah, the data you're collecting. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's, 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 I would say it's a work in process. I don't think we have uh, really gone back and used all of the high resolution data to analyze um, kind of what happens when you use or don't use the data. Are you talking about atmospheric data or oceanic data? What kind of data are you talking about? Se several of the speakers have made uh, a plea for collecting a lot more data, and that's the priority is to collect more data. I'm challenging you is, you know, do you have a really a clear understanding of the decisions that people are actually making oh. with all this data? And have you formally analyzed them to see where is actually the value of information in those decisions? I mean, so, what is the critical data actually awesome. needed? Awesome. I mean, is it the data you're collecting, or could it be some other aspect of, of data? Yeah. So I can think of, you know, I can think of two contexts to the best I can, I can think of right now. One is in the ocean context. There certainly has been a lot of work in, try, in using models in trying to piece together what additional information you'll gain about the climate system by actually getting a much more denser network of uh, surface ocean data as well as subsurface ocean data. And with regards to the subsurface ocean data, I think there's been an absolute revelation in the information that that is providing for improving weather forecasts. And I mean, weather, I think I have to go to all the way to actually seasonal. The seasonal forecasts seem to improve tremendously, uh, starting from about weekly timescales when you ingest the subsurface ocean data. And that actually was shown, the value of that was shown by models first. And then the Argo floats are now starting to go deeper. These are the measurement uh, components. And the, those instruments are going deeper and collecting data. And actually now, it is well known, but it's well understood that you get better information. Um, you know, on the atmosphere side, certainly um, we, we, haven't, we haven't sort of done that much. But I think the, uh, looking at, for example, the NASA GEOS uh, assimilation systems, as well as NCEP's work, uh, you have to say that there, there have been some cases where the data has come before the realization as to what the value of that has been. So it's been a little bit backwards. And I think there's, a interest, there's an emphasis now on actually doing these so-called Aussies, observing system simulation experiments with models, with high resolution models, to actually figure out maybe more intelligently where you can collect the atmospheric data in a, in a manner that is going to befit and improve the weather simulations. So I'm not sure I got your question exactly. I'll maybe defer to Barry and if, uh, if he wants to add something to this. I think uh, two aspects. One, certainly with the uh, advent of sat satellites, uh, weather forecasting has improved. I think that's very clear. However, I think Michael Oppenheimer showed that uh, we may make improvements on, shall we say, the scientific end of things. And that does not necessarily always translate into people making better decisions. Uh, I'm from the state of Oklahoma now, and uh, we're very concerned about severe weather, particularly tornadic conditions. And we've seen an actually doubling of warning times, but we've not cut the death rates because people don't necessarily do the wisest of things with increased warning. Hopefully on the climate question, uh, we will learn from that mistake. Yes, I'm... <laughs> I'm uh, Mr. Sia Ahmed. I'm uh, a former UN uh, director dealing with Montreal Protocol, um, uh, protecting the ozone layer. And I'm a climatologist. And um, talking about uncertainties, uh, I'm just was just wondering when we're talking about climate change, and uh, how many of the parameters are really interrelated to climate, and uh, 
we, when we talk about climatology, we know that many of the parameters are very important for climate, like, you know, deforestation, like uh, loss of biodiversity, like uh, growth of population, industrial pollution, El Nino, El Nina, Gulf Stream, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I was wondering to what extent do we add up all those parameters to build up those models? And, I'm, you know, I'm always a bit, uh, let's say, worried when it comes to modeling because we all know then, especially when it's on a long-term, uh, let's say, basis, whenever we have uncertainty, it can really, really uh, get you to very different results. And uh, my question would be, uh, don't you think that just focusing mostly, most of the time, on just uh, greenhouse, uh, gas, uh, uh, greenhouse gas emission is not a shortcut to explain the change of our climate? We definitely believe that climate is changing because of human activities, but all human activities. And uh, why don't we come back to the spirit of Rio in 2000, uh, was it in uh, 1992? when we are trying to tackle all the issues related to our climate, to, related to our, uh, let's say, planet as well, whereby all, also all the problems that have been uh, being caused by human activities are all put together. So I'm just wondering that uh, whether uh, a conference like this one should not also talk about all the problems that human activities are bringing about but rather than just to focus on uh, emission of uh, greenhouse uh, gases. Thank you. Uh, Michael, uh, you want to uh, take a first stab at that question? In every place, more and more is the buildup of the greenhouse gases. Now, it's certainly true that each individual location, each country, each region on Earth has other problems as well, which are related to environmental change. And we certainly need to deal with all of it eventually. But we need a special focus on greenhouse gases because, A, it is, a it is the one problem that's global, and B, there are things that can be done about it and should be done about it starting immediately. Uh, that's not to slight uh, the other aspects of the global environmental prob prob problematique. But if we don't do the greenhouse gas problem, the other stuff will, uh, will never solve the other problems either. I, I would add that... Uh you know, it is, uh, the um, modeling exercises uh, by all the models in the world almost, they take into effect, they take into account the various gases. The greenhouse, the, the famous greenhouse gases like CO2 and methane, but also nitrous oxide and all the halocarbons, including going up to sulfur hexafluoride, they're all taken into account. And the, the attribution calculations where you start attributing uh, the given change in, the, let's say, the model simulation to different elements, different entities, shows that most of the uh, major effect is due to carbon dioxide in the, in the sort of model-induced global warming run. In the global mean, it is certainly cr true that when you start to get to regional levels, there may be other contributors which are just as important. For example, aerosols in certain regions which are very, very, I mean, over Asia, for example, Aerosols do play a large part in, in terms of attribution. But in terms of just the global mean, uh, CO2, the focus gets there because it is, of all the gases we know, it has the longest residence time. So any molecule of CO2 being put out today, you just know from all the known physical and chemical principles, it's going to be there for a long period of time. Methane, nitrous oxide also are there for a long period of time, but less so. Halocarbons would have been there for an even longer time and in fact, if they had not been phased out, they actually would have, you know, if you go back to calculations in the 1980s, they show that if halocarbons had been increasing at the rate they were, they would have rivaled CO2 as the major contributor by 2030. But because they've been phased out, that's kind of one, uh, one sort of less thing to worry about. But certainly, I think the, in the, on the local scales, we still worry about the short-lived species, aerosols. In polar regions, we still worry about ozone. Uh, stratospheric ozone depletion in the Antarctic still affects climate in a way that is not direct. Indirectly, it affects the Antarctic climate, surface climate, and therefore it can affect then kind of circulation throughout the southern hemisphere. In the Arctic, there are when you have ozone depletions in, during certain winters, that does affect the Arctic surface climate. So we worry about them in the context of regional surface climate. That's certainly correct. 
But the global mean, you know, CO2 is the major problem, but not the only one, certainly. All right, thank you. Um, can we give the speakers another round of applause? Thank you. And thanks for the great visualizations. Um, so that concludes this event. Um, I do want to note that we do have another one coming up at 5.45 today about deploying innovative technology on climate change. Um, and I do want to also note that we, uh, we do invite you to experience the tech corner, which is right over there. Um, there's a number of interactive websites and applications that are related to climate that you can use. Um, at select times, there'll be experts explaining the ins and outs of those applications. And we're also demoing Discovery Channel's virtual reality programming. It is very cool. So come by and take a look at that. Um, and if you have any questions, please talk to the Tech Corner coordinator, which is Manny. Manny, raise your hand. Manny's in the back. Um, and, and please do so. Um, for all the viewers uh, uh, online, thank you for, for tuning in. And remember, you can always ask questions using the hashtag AskUSCenter. Thanks. <laughs>
I'm starting with them. So everybody, if you want to come over here, I'm actually going to be showing you a NASA Hyperwall animation. Um, basically, it's all themed about oceans, oceans and water resources. So here at COP21, NASA's role is to sort of illustrate to you all how we're using our entire Earth observing fleet that you see behind us that we do with collaborations with other agencies and international agencies, um, how we're using this Earth observing fleet to tell you about changes with respect to the land, atmosphere, ocean, and the cryosphere with respect to climate change. So again, what you're seeing here is the entire Earth observing fleet through uh, domestic agencies and international agencies working with NASA. And for again, we're focusing on the ocean. So you have different satellites, let's say SMAP, that does soil moisture and salinity. Jason 2 is one of the altimeter series that tells you all about sea level rise. And then you also have coming up QuickScat, which shows ocean uh, surface winds. Aquarius uh, did measure sea surface salinity. Unfortunately, um, that only had a four-year mission and has ceased. But overall, we have a slew of satellites that basically tell you about different aspects, again, of atmosphere, ocean, and land, and specifically for ocean that tell you about temperature, ocean winds, ocean currents, uh, gravity. We have a whole slew. And we're going to be showing you some of these throughout this talk right now. So with respect to COP21, we're basically seeing that we're getting increased atmospheric CO2. And as a result, we're getting warmer global temperatures in a nutshell. So what exactly the ocean does with that additional heat? Because the ocean absorbs actually 84% of the heat that is released. Because overall, the ocean has a hundred, excuse me, a thousand times the heat capacity of the atmosphere. So we're taking up a lot of that that additional heat. So if we go to the next slide, the ocean basically controls that heat distribution through two different mechanisms, one at the surface, one at the subsurface. So what you're seeing here is a surface ocean circulation. So what you have colored is in fact the ocean temperature, the sea surface temperature. So as you would expect, where we get the most maximum sunlight, the poles, excuse me, the, the equator, the tropics, is where you get the warmest waters. And as you go towards the poles, it gets colder. What you have actually moving here, sort of like snakes, um, it, or streamlines more so, is the ocean currents. So the currents are wind-driven at the surface, and it basically distributes that heat from the tropics to the poles, and also takes some of that colder water from the poles and transports it to the tropics. So you can see some of that here with regards to the Gulf Stream along the US East Coast and the Kuroshio current off the coast of Japan that basically is taking, again, that warm water and transporting it north. Then we have other current systems, such as the Agulhas down here off the coast of Africa, that basically is taking that warm water and then mixing it with cold and then transports that colder water north through these things called eddies. They're mesoscale, submesoscale features and is transporting that north, so redistributing basically the colder waters and sort of evening it out. It's sort of a checks and balance system, if you will. So you can look at this for, for hours. It's sort of like a modern day lava lamp. But this is, in fact, um, a, a model that we have within NASA called ECHO-2. Um, so it's 18 kilometers. Basically, ECHO-2 is actually uh, another presentation was talking about it with respect to we have satellite observations, we have models. This specific model actually inputs those satellite observations in, in situ to make it the most realistic scenario that we actually have. If we go to the next animation, this shows you how the ocean actually distributes heat with respect to the subsurface. So this is called the thermohaline circulation. Thermo meaning temperature, haline meaning salinity. So it's basically a density circulation, temperature and salinity. So basically, at, when you zoomed out for a little bit, you basically saw that the currents are being transported north. And the water mass associated with it, as it moves north, it becomes colder and more saline. And as a result, it becomes more dense. And there's a massive sinking cell here in the North Atlantic called the deep formation that then, then swings back along the coast and goes throughout the entire ocean system, basically returning to the surface after a 1,000 years. So there has been talks before uh, geoengineering in which they're talking about having pipes, dumping a whole bunch of CO2 into the ocean and saying, okay, well, problem solved. We've got rid of some of that CO2, but realistically, what goes in must come out, and it does have a time in which, and that would be a 1,000 years. So it's obviously we'd have a solution for the near term for our generations, but what about the generations to come?
So there's those, again, two mechanisms with the, which the ocean distributes the heat, the surface I showed you driven by winds, and the subsurface here driven by density. And you can basically see how that the, the currents itself and the subsurface go with respect to the globe. So we go to the next animation. So how exactly does this heat then manifest in other parameters? So what you're seeing here is a 22-year record of sea surface height, or sometimes termed sea level rise. And this is from different missions that we have with other domestic agencies, such as NOAA, and international agencies, such as CNES, the French Space Agency. So through TOPEX, Poseidon, Jason-1, Jason-2, and upcoming Jason-3, and a further down the road uh, mission that we have called SWAT, Surface Water Ocean Topography. Overall, all these missions tell us about how the sea level is rising or changing. So overall, if you didn't actually have this behind me, on average, since the satellite record, since 1992, there has been an increase in sea level of about three inches or eight centimeters. But as you can see here, that's not uniformly distributed across the globe. As we had before, basically in the Gulf Stream, you basically have where you have sea level that's actually lower then you have higher, basically the red means higher, blue means lower. And this is mainly due to a difference actually in that Gulf Stream that I mentioned before, which we can speed up and slow down. Then if you look over here and basically the Eastern Pacific, you see that overall sea level has actually decreased. And then it's going to zoom over into the Western Pacific where we've seen significant sea level rise or sea surface height rise. That's been unprecedented. What exactly is sort of causing these sea level differences is really three things. One third is due to thermal expansion, so basically the water is being warmed and as a result it expands. The second being we're getting a lot of ice loss with respect to the Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets, again due to that additional heat that we're getting. And the third being the basically a melting, if you will, of mountain glaciers. So all three of those things combined is contributing to the sea level rise that we're seeing in this 22 year record. And it would zoom to the next part, or oh, it's not, okay. But if you take my word, if not, you can go. Uh, we have this uh, amazing booklet over there that basically uh, has all the links to all these movies that we're seeing. So if you wanted to afterwards, you can check out this animation and you in fact see that the Western Pacific has a significant increase in sea level. So if you go to the next animation. So from the distribution of heat, that sort of showed you a longer term record, more multi-decadal from a 22 year record. We can also look at how heat impacts, those additional heat um, impacts, let's say, more synoptic scale variability. So what you're seeing here, again, is sea surface temperature, warmer waters occur in the tropics, colder in the poles, overlaid with ocean vector winds. So you're seeing that small scale synoptic variability. So you can see hurricanes, extra tropical storms, a whole slew of activities. So if we sp look at specific points, you can actually see hurricanes forming right here. So this is during hurricane season, and you can see basically as the tropical cyclones, they like to form during certain periods where the water is warmest to actually fuel the hurricane. They do need atmospheric conditions as well. Right now, all we're showing is really the oceanic component, which again sort of fuels them. So they basically need that warm water, deep warm water to fuel, but they also need atmospheric conditions. So weak wind shear, they basically need to grow up, if you will. But assuming that the atmosphere is, is static, let's say, and just looking at the ocean, it has extremely warm waters for them to grow, and as they would grow, it actually brings up that cold water, excuse me, that warm water, and brings up cold water below it, so you'd actually see cold wakes following behind these storms as they go, and if another hurricane actually passed over another one's cold wake, it actually can decrease, because again, they really need that warm water to thrive. So, any changes with respect to additional heat, so how this sea surface temperature distribution is present, if we change that, if it became much warmer with respect, we could in fact get an increase, let's say, in hurricanes, tropical storms, and the frequency of them could be more intense with, as well. And as in the previous presentation, if you weren't here, they were talking about Hurricane Sandy. Hurricane Sandy was a hurricane that hit basically the New York, New Jersey area in 2012, and they're talking about having a one meter, uh, excuse me, a sea level rise happening there on the order of one meter. If you had that one meter additional sort of sea level rise and you had a storm like that come in through the storm surge, it'd be a much more significant uh, sort of damage and destruction with respect to that. So clearly just the, uh, the input of heat impacting sea level rise, impacting again the storm frequency and intensities is important. So if we go to the next. So we went at it from a synoptic standpoint, and now if we look at it from an interannual standpoint, so on the order of two to seven years, something called El Nino. So how many of you guys are familiar with El Nino and La Nina? 
Yeah? Okay. So I assume you're all aware that right now we're experiencing El Nino conditions. Um, but I would like to say uh, there's been a lot of reports that have come out saying, how is this El Nino similar to 1997, 98? It was a big El Nino event. It was sort of the beginning of our satellite record. It was huge. And we really haven't had one on that same sort of magnitude since then. But they're talking about this one possibly being under that standpoint. What we should note, and this is what this animation sort of shows, it began um, in around, I think, December of 2013. You actually had this really, really, really warm sea surface temperature anomaly occurring in the Gulf of Alaska that some denoted the blob. So it was called the blob because it really was a blob that was just hanging out, and it was dubbed that by Nick Bond at the University of Washington. But as you can see in the time lapse, basically that blob then soon evolved and actually shifted to the east and hugged the entire west coast all the way to Baja. And you can actually see sort of the blob manifest in different ways. This is sort of called the junior blob. Um, but overall, these are all conditions that existed prior to that El Nino. So the ocean state prior to this El Nino event is unlike anything that we saw before in the satellite record. So how is this actually? Actually impacting the current El Nino, we're still unclear. We know that the magnitude of the El Nino is, is very significant, and it does sort of mirror that of the 97-98, but how exactly do these pre-existing ocean conditions and just this El Nino in general impact what kind of responses we're going to see? So we always talk about, okay, in certain regions you're going to be more wet or you're going to have more drought conditions. Potentially it might actually impact hurricane formation. That is still all TBD, to be determined, uh, wait and watch and see. Um, but it will be an interesting thing to see, and we can do that all with these satellite observations. So overall, the 2015-16 El Nino is thus very unprecedented, um, not only in its magnitude, but also in what happened before and, and what will happen after. So if you go to the next. And so to sort of illustrate, so we talked about that addition of heat, how it can actually impact, let's say, through sea surface temperature anomaly, sea level rise. But if now we want to see how it actually has impacts upon other variables. So what you're seeing here on the bottom is a map of precipitation, or excuse me, uh, animation more so of precipitation, where the blue denotes um, a lot more uh, precipitative regions or rainfall. So you have here something known as the ITCZ or intertropical convergence zone. So you get a lot of rainfall along the tropics. And what you have on the upper portion is sea surface salinity on the actual ocean as well as soil moisture on land. And this is from a new NASA mission called SMAP, Soil Moisture Active Passive, that launched in January of 2015. So this is relatively new. Um, and as this continues to go, we'll be able to see more of these changes with respect to climate change and also events such as El Nino. But just to illustrate, um, so where you would have, let's say, warmer waters, you might ex expect more convection and enhancement, i.e. more precipitation. And if we look at that associated band in the same region, you can see that salinity sort of shows these bluer purple values, which basically means that it is more fresh, that you're getting more rainfall there. Whereas you have these denoted regions here and the subtropical gyres of the Atlantic and even of the equatorial Pacific that are sort of these maximums. So they're showing a lot more um, higher saline values. And the real rationale here is E minus P, so evaporation minus precipitation. These regions are more stagnant, so they're getting a lot more evaporation going on, and therefore, there's a lot more salinity that's left behind. Whereas in these regions, we're getting a lot more rainfall, and therefore, you get lower salinity values. So it's sort of the combination of the two. So you can start looking at these things with respect to, again, climate change and some of these events that we talked about, whether it's hurricanes or even El Nino and La Nina, and see how they're changing with respect. If you go to the next. And I believe, yes. So um, near and dear to my heart is uh, biology and biogeochemistry. And I also love physical oceanography. But this just shows uh, animation. So this is from a model that we have at JPL at Jet Propulsion Lab, a part of NASA, and it's called ECHO2 Darwin. So ECHO2 is a physical model, and it's paired up with Darwin, which is this ecosystem model that you're seeing here. This is actually 18 kilometer resolution data, and what all these colors correspond to is different phytoplankton species. So basically it goes from small to large, and there's different phytoplankton species. There's at least four here. So these are small guys, medium, larger. So what exactly is a phytoplankton? So phytoplankton are the lowest trophic level in the food chain. They're basically algae. And everything else, any change in that level actually has implications upon the higher levels, so fish to, let's say, whales to people. 
I, I'm not eating whale, but others might. Um, but aside from that, you can basically see how these different phytoplankton species coexist with one another on the globe, and maybe how they're changing with respect to climate change. So currently, NASA does not have any satellite observations that can look at phytoplankton on the uh, phytoplankton species. We can look at something called chlorophyll A. Chlorophyll A is a photosynthetic pigment that actually occurs in phytoplankton that we infer and use as a proxy for phytoplankton biomass. But we really can't get to this level yet of saying that that chlorophyll A signature is associated with a certain species. We will, and it's sort of a teaser, we have an upcoming satellite mission called PACE that's going to be launched in 2022. 2023, that will actually be able to resolve and get at these phytoplankton species. So in the interim, we have these amazing models. This is just one. There is additional NASA models, NOAA models, the list goes on. A lot of people do have these ecosystem models, and again, this is just one that we're showing here. But why should we care? So aside from being a beautiful animation, Phytoplankton themselves are also important, not only for food, the food chain overall, where in, let's say, if you're off the coast of Africa here and you have an upwelling zone, you predominantly have a lot more diatoms, and as a result of that, you get a lot a larger fish species, and you would expect, in fact, a lot of people would have a, lot, a better fish catchment there. So it's not only important for the food chain, it's important to the people that really rely upon that food source. And if you have changes with regards to climate change, let's say warmer water is actually occurring within these regions, phytoplankton will change in association with it. These little critters do, in fact, like certain conditions. Um, they like certain temperatures, certain salinities, certain nutrient levels. And if they don't necessarily have those, they'll try and seek it somewhere else so that you would, in fact, get, let's say, a shift in phytoplankton. And fish and other higher species also have preferences. So if they, let's say, for an El Nino, let's say, so you see here, basically, you have this yellow region, which is more flagellates. If you have, um, and this is a normal scenario, so this is during a typical, let's say, neutral or La Nina phase, you get a lot more of these sort of larger species, and as a result, you would get, let's say, a lot more of the sardines, which is a heavy reliant food source for this region. Let's say you then have an El Nino. Those guys go away and are instead replaced with these smaller species. So sardines themselves, back in the 1997-98 El Nino, the sardine industry actually collapsed in Peru and was replaced by, um, what was the? Sardines, it was replaced by, oh, excuse me, the anchovy industry, and it was replaced by the sardine industry. Um, but overall, it basically shows that different phytoplankton due to certain responses, whether it's climate change or climatic events, do shift, and as a result, again, it can have implications upon those higher food chains and the carbon cycle. So that's sort of how it comes full circle. So these species, in addition to the food chain, also, let's say, diatoms, they're a larger species overall. So they can actually take up more CO2 and inject it into the ocean itself. For these smaller species, it would take a lot more of them to actually do the same sort of response. So by looking at these phytoplankton species, not only can you make inferences to these higher sort of food chains, let's say fish, things like that. Again, we can't observe fish from NASA yet, but maybe one day. But we can make inferences from looking at these phytoplankton species. But you can also make inferences with respect to the carbon cycle. How are these guys changing, and what implications will that have? Will there be more CO2 actually being uh, taken down into the ocean, or will be more be re being released? So that's where phytoplankton species sort of come into play, and this is something exciting that will be coming up again in the 2022-23 timeframe. So the final animation I would like to show sort of shows that carbon cycle link. So this is a, oh no. Well, what you would see here is actually a new animation that we just put together, um, and this is from a, a NASA-funded project called CMS, the Carbon Monitoring System. So this project itself uses, again, that ECHO2 Darwin model I talked about. So using that high-resolution physics that assimilates in satellite and in-situ data to make a more realistic sort of assimilation and couples it to this ecosystem model and chemistry model. So what you're seeing here, the colors, are in fact CO2 flux. So basically air-sea exchange, where the Orange here represents an outgassing. So CO2 is being released into the atmosphere in addition to what already exists in the atmosphere. And the blue is a CO2 sink. So you can see for the most part, the high poles or even the, the mid-latitudes here are a big sink of CO2. 
where in the tropics you get a significant outgassing. And you get an outgassing because you have these easterly trade winds that are basically bringing that subsurface CO2 that has been subducted down through biological processes and others and is bringing that back up to the surface and again releasing it to the atmosphere. So any change with respect to climate change can impact this natural balance. Maybe we wouldn't take up as much CO2 actually in these high latitude regions. Maybe we'd be outgassing more CO2 in the tropics. Having simulations like this and satellites, like the previous conversation the side event talked about, like OCO2 and GOSAT, watching the atmosphere, watching the ocean, and coupling the two together can tell us basically how the system is changing over time and how it will impact us people. So with this too, we talked about hurricanes a little bit ago. So um, I should note, and what you're seeing these vectors, these are in fact ocean surface winds. These are three, three hourly winds. Um, and you can actually see once it's sped up, sorry, it's still rendering, so that's why it seems a little slow. Um, but again, if you look at the booklet afterwards that I'll show you, you can look at all these animations um, in your own personal time and look at all the different complexities associated with it. But you'll have hurricanes actually form, and you can see some of them. And in association with that, we'll just wait for one to happen. As the hurricane's actually forming and going north, you can see basically the CO2 response associated with that. So in the perimeter of the hurricane, you're actually going to get this massive outgassing. And in the eye wall, you're actually going to get this sort of um, subduction, if you will, of CO2 into the ocean. So there's been a lot of questions in the past. How much do hurricanes actually contribute to sort of the CO2 balance? And I think that's still a question that's being addressed, and especially with climate change, how will that change if you're getting more free frequent, excuse me, less frequent and more intense hurricanes as being predicted. Um, but overall, this is sort of what makes my job at NASA so interesting. I get to play with all these different satellite observations to tell you how our Earth system is changing, how these things are all coupled together to better society and possibly policymakers to see how these things are changing and maybe what things we need to do. And this is just sort of one outlet in which we do it. And with that, um, I'll take any questions. And you guys can keep staring at this. It's, it's sort of to throw you off so you don't ask me difficult questions, right? I'm kidding. But do you guys have any questions? There's no, no, no dumb questions at all. Go ahead. Yes. So all these visualizations, thank you for bringing that up. So all of the visualizations that we're showing throughout the week. So if you haven't done so already, um, get one of these booklets. We have them at the front or even here at this desk in which if you go to page not, excuse me, 10 and 11, basically it says all the different side events. So the side events are noted in white, and all these hyperwall animations are illustrated in green, and there's different themes. So this one was ocean and water resources. There's one on uh, observing Earth from space, human footprints, atmospheric composition, the list goes on. So definitely come back and check all them out. But aside from that, all the visualizations that you see in those side events can all be found here. So basically it has a list of them, again, by a, sort of the themes. Again, here's Earth, ocean, and water resources. And each of these animations has a little description and a URL. You can also sort of blank out the go-to question mark and just look at additional hyperwall animations that exist. So this is called a hyperwall. Um, but there's tons of animations aside from the ones in this book. And they're all publicly available and free. <laughs>